morning, everyone, and welcome to our worship service here at the Butler Church, both to you who are gathered with us in person and those who are joining us online. This um, gives us an opportunity, as it were, to refocus. I'm not sure all that you're bringing with you this morning, what your weeks have been, nor do I know exactly what you anticipate in the week to come. But this hour together of songs, of reading texts, of hearing the, the text explained, give us the opportunity to center, to refocus, to bring our attentions clearly back to God. So again, welcome to the Butler Church this morning. Let me invite you, as you are able, to stand and join with me in the, in the invocation, which is printed in your bulletins as well as on the screens. Let's read this together. O oh God, light of the ones who know you, life of the souls who love you, strength of those who seek you, help us to know you so that we may truly love you, so to love you that we may truly serve you, whose service is perfect freedom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Standing as we sing.
Again, a, word, word, a warm word of welcome to all of you for joining us this morning. We come, don't we, with hearts of anticipation, expectation, open for surprises, and appreciative that God in his goodness and grace joins us in this place. So welcome again to all of you who are here or online. There are a couple of announcements that I'd briefly like to highlight for you. I wanted to say this, this past uh, Sunday night, we had um, the, our cross-cultural meal, for which many of you attended. It was a wonderful time. The food was great and plentiful. Uh, the entertainment singing was great, too. But one thing really struck me. If you, some of us were sitting there thinking about what it would be like to clean up after this event, to put away all these tables and tablecloths and who's going to do this. And when the event ended, <laughs> everybody joined in. Little boys were rolling tables, uh, putting things in their proper places, and before you knew it, everything was put away. It was striking. Well, I say that not only to applaud, which I'm doing, but to say that you're going to have another opportunity to do the same kind of thing on October 14th. We have a whole day work day to help take care of this place. We need as many volunteers as possible, not only to put things away or to sweep or to paint, but to provide goodies and drinks for the laborers, for the volunteers. If you're able to do that on the 14th, please contact the church office and let them know of your availability. Let me also remind you that this Friday is food distribution day as we do on a regular basis, this Friday, October 6th at 9 a.m. here at the church. Please stand together and make everybody feel as welcome as possible and greet people, look for someone you may not recognize and welcome them here to the Butler Church.
Well, we always enjoy our greeting time. And now we're going to continue with worship uh, in preparation for our communion this morning, singing a hymn that we learned just last year, uh, number 243, Come Share the Lord. And if you're like me, this is what I call an earworm. Because when you leave today, you will probably be singing this song. Come share the Lord. We gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living challenging, difficult, painful, but pivotably, pivotably important in terms of the welfare and salvation of the world. But during this time, as he anticipated what was to come, he wanted, as probably any of us would, to be surrounded by our closest friends, those most intimate with us. And as they were gathered in this upper room in the old city in Jerusalem, anticipating the coming days, Jesus said, I want to leave you something to remember, the, remember me by. I want to leave you a symbol that whatever happens, whatever you experience, when you come back to this symbol, you'll be reminded of my great love of my compassion, of my mercy. And so, in the middle of a meal in this upper room, Jesus took a loaf of bread and broke it. And he said, this bread is my body, broken for you. And every time you partake of it, I want you to be rem reminded of my great and unalterable love for you. And then, a bit later, he took the cup, said, this cup is my blood. It's a new covenant. And it shouts, I love you, through all the circumstances of life. Every time you drink of this cup, be reminded 
that you are my special, chosen, and loved people. So as the servers take their positions, I'd like to invite you to come front, if you are able, to either of the stations, and they will give you a cup and a piece of bread. Take those back with you to your seat, and we'll partake of them together in just a moment. And again, if you're not able to come up front, I'll ask you just in a second or two, those of you who can, please start coming to the stations, and then I'll ask in a moment if any of you need the bread and the cup brought to you. Raise your hand, please, if you need someone to bring the elements to you. There's one in the... Brothers and sisters, this bread is the body of Christ broken for you. Brothers and sisters, this cup is the blood of Christ shed for you. We're profoundly grateful, O oh Lord, for the shedding of your blood, the giving of yourself, that we, regardless of who we are, where we've been, what we've done, might live. Thank you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. If you could just place your cup in the basket as it comes around. Thank you. The Old Testament reading today is from Exodus 17, 1 to 7, and I am not Rudy. He couldn't be here, so I'm reading for him. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, 
Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead to the people. Go ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? This is the reading. The Lord truly is among us. The screen says, invitation to joy-filled giving or generosity. As I was looking to prepare for this, I came across an essay that was published by the University of Notre Dame in 2009, which explores the science of generosity, and I quote from it. By generosity, we mean the virtue of giving good things to others freely and abundantly. And then there are four uh, dimensions of this generosity. Generosity also involves giving to others not simply anything in abundance, but rather giving those things that are good for others. Generosity always intends to enhance the true well-being of those to whom it gives. The second point What exactly generosity gives can be various things. Money, possessions, time, attention, aid, encouragement, emotional availability, and more. Third point, insofar as generosity is a virtue, to practice it for the good of others also necessarily means that doing so achieves one's own true long-term good as well. And fourthly, and so generosity, like all the virtues, is in people's genuine enlightened self-interest to learn and practice. Now that's society's definition of generosity. Our faith adds yet another dimension to generosity or giving. It is an expression of our love and gratitude for what we have been given. God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son in order that we might have a genuine loving relationship with him. So we thankfully give back to him in order to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ's saving sacrifice to others. So On the screen, you see three ways in which you can practice this generosity today or in the coming week. So please pray with me as we dedicate these gifts to his service. Father in heaven, we thank you for your generosity to us, for your love, which looked for the, to enhance our well-being, not only physical well-being, but you loved us so much that you sent your only son in order that we might find a loving relationship with you. And for that, we give you thanks. So today, as people give, or as they give through the week, or, or whenever, we ask, Lord, that you would bless that which is given in order that more people might be reached for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen.
wind the film back about 15 years ago when we were still in Pennsylvania I was at a conference sponsored by my own denomination and a young man answered a question on the floor and I turned to the person next to me and I said who is that articulate bright young man and they said he's Brian Ross he's a church planter in Reading didn't think a whole lot more about it, stashed it away in file D, drive D, until some years later we had a position at the seminary in pastoral ministry, and that file came up, and I thought, I wonder if Brian would want to come to California. So I called him, and one thing led to the other, and I can honestly say in my years as president of the seminary, the best thing we did was hire Brian. So Brian, a church planter, preacher, consultant, but more than that, an incredibly cool human being. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Terry. Um, that was too kind, as you have always been to me. My favorite statement there was saying that young man. It has been a number of years since someone has referred to me as a young man. Why do we come to church? And I mean if we want to come to church. I'm in enough churches and I meet a lot of people that are at church but they don't always want to be at church. Maybe they're trying to curry favor with mom, so they come to church. Maybe even more, their girlfriend wants them to come to church, so they come to church. I always give them permission to completely tune me out. But if we want to come to church, why are we here? Why do we drag ourselves out of bed on the weekend and, and sometimes walk in with a large thermos of coffee? Isn't it because we're looking for some hope? Life's hard. Life is often very difficult. And we want to be in a positive place and often hear a motivational talk from someone up here. In a community that views life uh, kind of like the glass that is always half full. That's why we come to church. Unless we are coming to get in good with our girlfriend's parents. The Gospel of Luke is the, the third book in the New Testament. It's kind of a biographical account of Jesus of Nazareth. And in today's passage, we find people hanging around Jesus. They've heard good things about him. He seems like a positive person. And we find a motivational, hope-filled, positive context. Luke chapter 21, beginning in verse 5 says, some people were talking about the beautiful stones used to build the temple and about the gifts that had been placed in it. So you can imagine the scene, right? It's a sunny day, maybe like yesterday, today, just kind of the perfect weather. People are commenting on the beauty of the temple, this most positive, hope-filled structure. This is where people made sacrifices to God, where they prayed and confessed and talked openly about the most important deep things with a loving creator, where they sought to become a new and different and better person. And here in this account, people are even commenting on the positive ways that people are investing their money. I mean, they could have used it to buy more drink, or luxurious clothing, or to chase women, but they are investing it in this positive building of life change. 
And we know from the stories of Jesus that he was often at parties. But I'm, I wonder if he was always good at parties. Because the next verse, verse 6. Jesus said, do you see these stones? The time is coming when not one of them will be left in place. They will all be knocked down. Was Jesus good at parties? It's a positive moment. People are listing these positive things. He's like, see this place of inspiration and beauty and hope? It's all going to come down eventually. Then he keeps going. Verse 7. Some people asked, uh, teacher, when is all this going to happen? How can we know when these things are about to take place? And Jesus replied, don't be fooled by those who come and claim to be me. They will say, I am Christ. Now is the time, but don't follow them. When you hear about wars and riots, don't be afraid. These things will have to happen first, but that isn't the end. Nations will go to war against one another, and kingdoms will attack each other. There will be great earthquakes, and in many places people will starve to death and suffer terrible diseases, all sorts of frightening things will be seen in the sky. Again, thanks, Jesus. People gathered for this positive moment among their difficult lives, and he's saying the center of everything where you find hope, it will all be destroyed. And it's hard to put words around the Jewish temple in this time. It's kind of like maybe if you put your church and combined it with the White House and the place where you keep all your old family photos, maybe Grandma's house, and you all rolled them together. And Jesus says it's all going away. People say, um, when? And he says, well, when others claim they are Christ or the answer, watch out. There will be riots and political battles and ethnic groups will have intense conflicts with other ethnic groups. It'll kind of be like hell on earth. Again, I'm not sure that Jesus was great always at parties. Now here, he's not literally talking about the end of the world but at least what would feel like the end of the world for these original hearers and his contemporaries. He was talking about when this temple would be destroyed, which it was, roughly around 40 years later, in 70 AD, as the Roman general Titus came into town and killed thousands and enslaved others, and it was a scene of horror. But why is this in the Bible? What's it have to do with us all these centuries later? Everything that we hold dear will eventually slip away. Our work, our community, our bodies, our friends, and our family wasn't just those people back in first century Palestine that Jesus had to warn, everything you care about will eventually go away. That's true for all of us. Back in 2013, uh, Tim Kreider wrote an op-ed in the New York Times with a very inspiring title. It was called, You Are Going to Die. Kreider says, almost everyone dies in a hospital now, even though absolutely nobody wants to. Because by the time we're dying, all the decisions have been taken out of our hands by the well, and the well are without mercy. Of course, we hospitalize the sick and the old for some good reasons, 
But I think we also segregate the elderly from the rest of society because we're afraid of them as if age might be contagious, which it turns out it is. We don't have a choice. You are older at this moment than you've ever been before, and it's the youngest you're ever going to get. The mortality rate is holding at a scandalous 100%. Pretending death can be indefinitely evaded with hot yoga or a gluten-free diet or antioxidants or just by refusing to look is craven denial. I'm sure Kreider is also a hit at parties in Manhattan. The last few years, I have personally been engaged in some research about spiritual practices, different ways that men and women try to connect with God, to, um, to find some intimacy with our Creator, and also hopefully in an open spirit to become a different and better person. And to my surprise, I found out that historically, some people, as a spiritual practice, would go into a spirit of meditation and prayer and meditate on their death. Literally, as a spiritual practice, close your eyes, be in prayer, and visualizing their decaying corpse in front of them. And as a good contemporary American, I thought, wow, that seems kind of gross and morbid, so I want to try it. And as someone who has practiced this fairly regularly for a few years, let me just say, it's a little trippy, but I don't know that it's negative. I think I understand a little bit more of what Jesus was getting at with some of these words that echo through the centuries to us. Because I found if I consider that everything in my life, my relationships, my career, my mind, my family, my body, it's all going to slip away from me. It gives me a different perspective on what's important. Different questions begin to emerge. Maybe they do for you, too. If you're a, a senior here this morning, do you spend much time thinking, what does my creator want me to do with the time I have left? Yes, even if you're retired. Yes, even if you couldn't be here today physically and you're watching on the screen. Do you consider that? Because even if you're at the very tail end of your life, you're still here for a reason. What conversations still need to be had with people that you care about before you're finally gone? Have you had those conversations? Will you? And if you're here this morning and you are still young and beautiful and fabulous and you're someone that doesn't know what wrinkles are like yet or losing your hair or even worse, having hair grow in the wrong places, that, that is worse. I still think there's something here for you too. In the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, the writers of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1 says, Remember your Creator in your prime before the days of trouble arrive. And those years about which you say, I take no pleasure in these. I think the writer wants those of you who are still young and energetic and hopefully everything is in front of you 
is saying the longer you wait to consider what ultimately matters, the harder it will be to align your life around it. Have you ever been around grumpy old people? What made them that way? It's simple. Plato talked about this way long time ago, way even before Jesus. If you live your life for your desires and your dreams and your goals and having a good time and lots of laughs, eventually you get a little bit older and you can't do it anymore. And if that's what your life has been all about, it's not very fun. And then other things happen in life that you never wanted to happen, and so you become disappointed and cynical and can't do what you wanted to, and what you always wanted to, you realize you'll never achieve, and that's why some older people are grumpy. So those of you who are a little younger, if you don't want to be a someone who's yelling at kids to get off your lawn, or at Thanksgiving to be just kind of whispered about in the corner, right now seek what ultimately matters. And as life moves along and more is taken from you, you'll still be okay. Ask your creator, what would it look like for you to remember him now in the prime of life? Just ask as I'm saying it, just out loud when you're alone, as if your creator there, what would it look like for me to remember you right now? And then listen and see what comes to mind. But thankfully, Jesus goes in a different direction. Verse 18. He says, but don't worry. You will be saved by being faithful to me. Don't worry. Be faithful to me. I mean, Jesus tells it straight here. Life is brief. It's not easy. It will eventually be taken from you, probably in a time you were not expecting. But if you trust me in my ways, it'll be okay. And many of you know the story, right? I mean, Jesus is unjustly accused of crimes, even though he's the most beautiful, loving person imaginable. He's tortured. He's executed by the state and murdered as a relatively young man. And yet he rises physically from the grave and eventually ascends again to the Father. He says, I hold the solution for everything going away from you. He knows what it's like, and he came out the other side. You see, eventually we will lose everything. But if we follow Jesus, we will gain everything that finally matters. You will. If. You trust Jesus and his ways. Now, I am naturally, by nature, not by spirit, but by nature, naturally a little pessimistic. And you say, well, that's kind of surprising, Brian, with all this death talk today. That, that really surprises us. But after a conversation I had with a close friend several years ago, he kind of helped me see that I needed to personally lean in more intentionally, spiritually with Jesus. And I have been the last several years. Yes, I have a lot of problems. You could ask my kids, they'll tell you. Ask my wife, she'll have a long list. But personally spending time with Jesus is not one of them. Last October... 11 months ago, I was back in my hometown of Columbus, Ohio, when my dad finally died of cancer at age 70. 
And when the fellas from the, uh, the funeral home showed up to take his body, we had a little problem. Dad was back in his bedroom, and uh, the hallway was kind of narrow and windy, and one of them came out and said, uh, Mr. Ross, uh, we can't really get the gurney back there. And I said, well, let's carry him out. And they were like, really? I said, yeah. Let's carry him out. If you've ever been holding the hand of a loved one when they die, you know there's nothing more still than a corpse of a family member. And if you've ever physically carried your dad's body out of the house, you know there's nothing more cold than his ankles after the spirit has been gone. But after all of this, a number of my friends, you know, caring people, would say, Brian, how you doing? I'd say, I'm fine. And they'd say, no, how, how are you doing? And I'd say, no, really, I am fine. I have been investing in personal experiences with Jesus, and I know this life is the shadow, and that is the most real. I know that Jesus rose from the dead and is alive and well in a realm that we can't always see. And my dad, as best as he knew how, was tracking with him. I'm fine. Do you know this right now? And I, I don't mean, do you know the Sunday school answer? I mean, you're at church. Most people don't go to church today. You're here. You know the answers. But I mean, do you believe this experientially? Are you having regular connection with God and Jesus that even when finally things are not okay, that you will still be okay? And if not, what would need to happen with you that you would be? Now let me jump back to Jesus here and some of his good positive vibes he has this morning. Verse 12. He says, before all this happens, again, the destruction of the temple, everything they hold dear, you will be arrested and punished. You will be tried in your meeting places and put in jail. Because of me, you will be placed on trial before kings and governors. But this will be your chance to tell about your faith. Don't worry about what you will say to defend yourselves. I will give you the wisdom to know what to say. None of your enemies will be able to oppose you or to say that you are wrong you will be betrayed by your own parents, brothers, family, and friends. Some of you ev will even be killed because of me. You will be hated by everyone. Again, more hope and cheer from Jesus. He tells his contemporaries that even before this temple is destroyed, it's not going to be easy to be one of my followers. There are other religious movements, other political movements that will be against you. Even some of your family members might be against you. And so there's this irony we find with Jesus where he says, if you want to ultimately be okay when everything is not okay, if you want to ultimately be okay when everything goes away from you, trust me, but your life might be a little more difficult if you do in the short run. The life that Jesus offers does include some temporary challenges that other people do not face. It does. It makes your life a little more complicated. My life is complicated right now in lots of ways because my wife and I have four kids. Three of them are teenagers. One is a young adult. 
Recently, one of my teenage daughters came home from shopping at Tilly's and was like, Dad, what, have you, what do you think about my boots? Tell me what you think about my boots. Now, I've never known my daughter to care about my sense of fashion ever before in life. But what was she doing? She was looking for some affirmation. One of my sons had a birthday party at the house, and I'm walking by in another room, and I heard one of his guests kind of saying some bad things about someone who wasn't there. And I kind of chuckled to myself, not at the gossip or the slander, but this was the young guy who was so self-conscious when he came in the door, he couldn't look me in the eye. But he has negative things to say to other people. Why? Because they're teenagers. And it's hard. They're not kids anymore, but they're not self-sufficient adults. They're in that weird in-between state. They're not sure who they are. They're becoming aware of like social status and power games and, and sexual attraction and aren't sure what to do with that. And so they feel vulnerable. They feel like bad things could happen to them at any moment. And what do vulnerable people do? Vulnerable people want to feel better by getting everyone around them to agree with them and to affirm them. That's what vulnerable people do. Like teenagers, most adults are more vulnerable than we like to admit. Life is unpredictable. For many people, particularly older people right now, our culture feels very scary. You feel like you could lose everything, and again, eventually, we all know as grown-ups who deal with reality, eventually, you will lose everything. You are vulnerable. And so a lot of people around us demand that we agree with them and be like them in everything. Socially, politically, culturally, on all the hot button issues of our day. And so if you are open to Jesus and you trust his ways, it might get worse for you. Why? Because everybody wants you to trust in their politics like they do and you don't. Because everybody wants you to rally around them about the, mat the issues that matter to them. And, and maybe you care some, but you're like, ultimately, that's not where I'm at. Because people want you to fight the people that they fight. Because if you're on their side, they feel a little bit more safe. And you're like, no, I don't agree with them on everything. But I'm called to love and befriend them. If you take your cues from a Jewish man who was crucified 2,000 years ago, a lot of people will be frustrated with you because hurting people want you to be just like them. And Jesus' way is something different. In my office... Uh, at the seminary, besides my academic library, uh, I keep a few personal books, mainly because my wife doesn't want them at home. And one of them is some of my old yearbooks. And maybe once or twice a year, I'll flip through them, not, not to get a chuckle at the old turtlenecks that we used to wear in cardigans or our pegged guest jeans, uh, sometimes to miss my feathered hair. Uh, I know I'm unrecognizable now, but... Um, on the bottom, second one from the right. Uh, there, I used to have glorious hair, Rich. It, it was glorious back in the day. That was a long time ago. But sometimes I flip through these old yearbooks, not for nostalgia, but perspective. And thanks to Facebook, we all know the rest of the story of life after high school. Some of the coolest guys that all the girls wanted to be with and all the rest of us guys wanted to be like, back at that time, they're incarcerated. Some of the beautiful gals that we all wanted to be connected to have had very difficult lives and some of them are already six feet under. 
And some of those people way back then, you know how young people can be, that socially we put through hell are thriving now as early middle-aged adults. Life is best lived with the long game in mind. And Jesus calls us to the ultimate long game. Don't live for what everyone else is doing right now, but for the ultimate future. Again, Jesus said in verse 6, Do you see these stones? The time is coming when not one of them will be left in place. They will all be knocked down. Again, this is not a typical American positive motivational talk this morning. But Jesus names something that we need to keep in mind. Everything that you hold dear will eventually slip away. Your work, your community, your body, your friends and family. Jesus claims to know the way through it all. To offer life beyond this reality that we're used to. A way that most people are not taking on. But will you take it on? Are you presently taking it on? Not everyone will agree with you, but if you take it on, you will know deep within that no matter what happens to you, you will be okay. And even when everything is not okay, you will still be okay. Jesus says, don't worry, you will be saved by being faithful to me. Are you experiencing that right now? Thank you. Conclude our service with number 430, Rise Up, O Church of God. I'll ask you to stand as we sing. to come. May he make his face to smile upon you and be gracious unto you. And Lord, we give you thanks that you are totally, thoroughly trustworthy and pray for the grace that we need to live in that level of commitment to you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.